Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansi. Tonight, Michael Spavor found guilty in a Chinese court. They are trumped up charges for which there's absolutely no basis in law. He's been held in a Chinese prison for years, now a conviction and an order for deportation. Tonight, what that means for him as Meng Wanzhou's extradition case is back in court here. With the Chinese, there's no coincidence. Quebec lays out the details of its vaccination passport plan. It will push people to take the vaccines and will be more protected. Like, how far is it going to go? How it will work for everyone 12 and up. A reluctant resignation from one of America's most prominent politicians. In my mind, I've never crossed the line with anyone. Why some say it's a turning point for the Me Too movement. And big home, meet narrow road. There was no going back. He couldn't turn around. How moving house turned into an arborist nightmare in Manitoba. This is The National. We begin tonight with a major development in the ordeal faced by Canadian Michael Spaver. He's been found guilty of espionage by a Chinese court. The sentence, 11 years, a fine, and an order for deportation. Spaver and fellow Canadian Michael Kovrig have been held for more than two and a half years. Their detention described as stark isolation, subject to constant interrogation, widely believed to be retaliation for Canada's 2018 arrest of Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou. This verdict comes just one day after another Chinese court upheld a death sentence for Robert Schellenberg, a Canadian convicted of drug smuggling. The timing not lost on Michael Spaver's family and certainly not lost on the Canadian government. Tonight, we'll take you through the guilty verdict and what to make of that sentence. We have comprehensive coverage, and we begin with Katie Simpson, who's been leading our coverage of this breaking news story from Ottawa tonight. Katie, take us through this sentence. Well, we were expecting this to be a guilty verdict. 99 percent of the cases like this in China end up with a guilty verdict. That was expected. What is unexpected is one element of the sentence. We were expecting the guilty verdict and then find out what the sentence is. OK, 11 years, that was expected. Around that range, anywhere after over 10 years, was expected. There's going to be a fine. But part of the sentence is a former formal order of deportation. And that is the big question in all of this. In China, you don't necessarily have to serve your sentence before you are deported. An example of this we saw back in 2016, Kevin Garrett, he had been found guilty of similar charges. He was a Canadian held in a, a Chinese jail for more than two years. And two days after his verdict, he was deported back to Canada. Now, before all of this unfolded tonight, I was cautioned by sources that any sort there's no timeline at play here. That 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 case, the Garrett case, uh, was an extraordinary circumstance that th there's no expectation this is going to be turned around in a couple of days. This was an expected step in the Chinese justice system. There was going to be a verdict, and it was widely expected to be a guilty verdict. But the key here is deportation. We do not know when yet, and that's what everyone should be focusing on to find out when, in fact, Michael Spaver will be deported, if that happens before he has to serve more any more time. By the way, he's on day 975 at this point. That's when this whole ordeal began. So the key thing to look for going forward is when will he be deported? Less than 30 seconds. Katie, response from Canada and Canadian allies tonight? It's huge. At the embassy in uh, Beijing, more than 50 diplomats from 25 different countries, allies including the United States, Germany, France, Australia, are all there to send a message to Beijing. They all say that these detentions are arbitrary, these charges are trumped up, and they're trying to send a message, a unified message to Beijing that what is going on with these Canadians is unacceptable. Katie Simpson in Ottawa tonight. Thank you. Canada's relationship with China has been fractured since Meng Wanzhou's arrest in 2018, with both sides hurling accusations, even economic sanctions, at each other since then. Meng's case returns to court tomorrow. Travis Danraj looks at the strained relationship between Ottawa and Beijing and how the fate of three Canadians hangs in the balance. Canada's ambassador to China in Dangdong last night draws a straight line between Robert Schellenberg's failed appeal and what's happening in a Vancouver courtroom this week. I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, these are happening 
right now while events are going on in Vancouver. Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou's lawyers made last-ditch efforts to stay her extradition case. Tomorrow, arguments on the substance of the extradition request finally begin. If she were to um, end up in jail in the U.S., Beijing would find that extremely insulting, a, a big loss. Canada-Chinese relations took a nosedive after RCMP arrested Meng in 2018 at Washington's request, just before Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig were detained. They are trumped-up charges for which there's absolutely, absolutely no basis in law. Today, as Spavor waited to hear his fate, Ottawa condemned Robert Schellenberg's death sentence. We have repeatedly expressed to China our firm opposition to this cruel and inhumane punishment. Today, Western allies also condemn Beijing, just as they did during the trials of Spavor and Kovrig back in March. Some China watchers say that solidarity could have an impact. It does embarrass the Chinese government. They don't like to be embarrassed internationally. Here at home, the government continues to take heat over its handling of the crisis. We need to use every resource possible at the diplomatic level to, to save uh, Mr. Schellenberg's life. Conservative leader Erin O'Toole even called for a boycott of the Beijing Olympics. Beijing has to know that the world is watching the genocide taking place against the Uyghurs. They've watched what's been happening in Hong Kong and the situation with Mr. Schellenberg, Mr. Spaver, and Mr. Kovrig. The world is watching. Canada has a complex, intertwined relationship with China. It is our second largest trading partner. As tensions continue, the way forward remains unclear, as does a path home for the Canadians whose lives are on the line. Travis Danrash, CBC News, Ottawa. And we will have more on this story later in the hour. I'll speak with the president of the Canadian International Council on his reaction to the verdict and what it means for the Canadians jailed and what comes next in Canada's already complicated relationship with China. Well, the daily number of new COVID cases in Canada has been on the rise since the start of the month. August began with more than 1,000 new cases, numbers not seen any time in July. That jumped to 1,500 on Friday and peaked at 1,800 this past Sunday. Today, the country recording 1,345 new infections. That rise in cases has Quebec officials worried about a Delta-driven fourth wave. While 70% of eligible residents are fully vaccinated, the province wants to encourage more people to get their shots by creating Canada's first vaccine passport. As Alison Northcott shows us, today they showed how it will work. Quebec's health minister says a fourth wave is inevitable, but another lockdown may not be. So that we do not have to reconfine and to avoid closing activities or businesses the best way is vaccination. But we will also use the vaccination passport. As of September 1st, at places like restaurants, bars and festivals, people 12 and up will have to prove they're vaccinated to get in. It won't be mandatory for staff who work there. First, though, the province will test out the technology, which involves a QR code and a free app at a Quebec City bar and a gym in Laval. 70% of eligible Quebecers are fully vaccinated. The province wants to get that to 84% by the end of the month. Some Montrealers think a vaccine passport will help. It will push people to take the vaccines. I will be more protected. I think it can bring more people to get vaccinated. They want to go to restaurants again, hang out with their friends again. So I think that's a good idea, yeah. But others worry about the requirement. It's, it's almost a sense of discrimination too, I think, at the same time, you know, like, like how far is it going to go? Show me proof you've been vaccinated and I'm good to go. This gym owner already requires his members to be vaccinated, but says he's so faced major blowback there. for it. Uh, I've been trolled to death. If you want to enjoy coming here, there are, you do have a responsibility. I think it's normal that we, that some people still have question. There are questions the too from civil liberties and, groups uh, and opposition politicians who say the plan lacks transparency, but. There are still millions of people in Quebec who have not received their second, their two doses of vaccines. Can you imagine the number of people who are potential victims of COVID? This That's expert says it's one so more tool that could help make the next wave smaller. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. And a couple more notes on this story. Visitors to Quebec will also need to show proof of vaccination. Meanwhile, Ontario confirming today it will not be issuing vaccine passports. 
The University of Ottawa is making vaccinations mandatory this fall. Staff, students and faculty will need to have at least one shot by September 7th, the second required by October the 15th. The university says anyone not getting vaccinated will face strict rules and that includes frequent testing. And in Newfoundland and Labrador, the masks can be off tonight, but while they're no longer mandatory, the province's chief health officer says they're still a good idea, especially in places where people can't physically distance. Some businesses have said they'll still require patrons to mask up. Now to a CBC News exclusive. The military has refused a request to call in the RCMP to independently investigate a rape accusation against a senior military leader. That's against the wishes of the alleged victim. It also defies a recommendation by a former Supreme Court justice from a landmark report endorsed by the Liberal government. Ashley Burke has our story. Stephanie Vio went public four months ago with one of the most high-profile rape allegations against a senior leader of the forces. And I want justice for me, but I also want justice for others. Her request to the military clear for RCMP officers to independently investigate her case. But now, months later, the military says it won't. If this case can't be handled in uh, the sensitive and independent manner that it requires, uh, how can any woman in the Canadian military come forward and feel confident that her, her complaint will be investigated properly and thoroughly? Vio was a 19-year-old steward on board a Navy ship when she alleges her superior, Hayden Edmondson, raped her. A claim denied by Edmondson, now a vice admiral and former head of HR. The military's refusal to hand over Vio's case goes directly against what the Liberal government promised. We will be making significant changes uh, to the way the military functions uh, in the coming, uh, coming months. Significant changes that include recommendations from former Supreme Court Justice Morris Fish to temporarily transfer sexual assault cases to civilian authorities until victims have more rights in the military. We want to ensure our people have a voice when interacting with the military justice system. Experts say VO's case is the first test of the Liberals' commitment to that, and it has failed. We have a prime minister who's identified as a feminist prime minister, um, but he and the Minister of Defence have zero credibility on this file. They have zero trust, especially from victims of sexual assault in the military. Actually, where does all of this leave VO? Well, her lawyer says that she has to move forward with the military's investigation, even though she's deeply uncomfortable with the process and doesn't trust the military to properly investigate such a senior leader. And in response, what are officials saying? Well, the Defense Department says that it started to implement 36 of Fish's 107 recommendations and is working on a plan to roll out the rest. Sajjan's office said the minister remains committed to the complete overhaul of the Canadian Armed Forces. And as for the Prime Minister, his office says Justin Trudeau's focus is on supporting sexual assault survivors. But in this case, VO says she doesn't feel supported at all. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you. Accusations of sexual harassment have led to a high-profile political resignation in the United States. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo has been under pressure to step down as story after story emerged. And as Chris Reyes shows us, while Cuomo says he's leaving office, he is not giving up his fight against the allegations. My resignation will be effective in 14 days. A reluctant resignation from one of the most prominent politicians in the U.S., Governor Andrew Cuomo spent mere seconds stepping down, using the rest of his 20-minute public statement to deny sexual harassment allegations against him and defend his record. In my mind, I've never crossed the line with anyone. But I didn't realize the extent to which the line has been redrawn. I take full responsibility for my actions. Governor Andrew Cuomo. It's been more sexually than a week since a report by the Attorney General accused Cuomo of sexually harassing 11 women, including a former staffer. He went to go kiss me on the cheek, he quickly turned his head, and he kissed me on the lips. What he did to me was a crime. As chairperson of Now, New York State Governor will have its first Mission. female governor, Kathy Hochul, Cuomo's second in command. Cuomo's going down. Once praised for his handling of the pandemic that hit New York City hard last year, in Times Square today, little sympathy. 
because he was there for so long, I guess he always felt like he couldn't do nothing wrong. I did not mean any sexual connotation. I did not mean any intimacy by it. Now one of the highest profile falls in the Me Too era, the case against Cuomo has added fresh fuel to a conversation sparked by the movement. This is no longer okay to grab women, to touch them in any part of their body. It's not okay in the workplace. It's not okay outside of the workplace. Some predict the governor's troubles are only beginning. One of his accusers has already filed a criminal complaint against him launching a police investigation. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. A goalie coach's social media posts have prompted the Toronto Maple Leafs minor league team to part ways with him. Maple Leafs president Brendan Shanahan said the organization made a mistake and will not be hiring Dusty Emu as the Marlies goaltending coach. The British Columbian had a long career as a player, including a stint with Japan's national team. His hiring, though, was met with outrage online as fans discovered Emu liked anti-vaccination posts on Twitter, as well as supporting the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. His account has since been deleted. In B.C., several First Nations are coming together to investigate a former North Vancouver residential school. The goal is to find out what happened to the children who attended but never came home. Karen Pauls has the details on the investigation and the latest on what Ottawa is doing to assist efforts like these. Led by elders, leaders of three nations announced they've begun the search for unmarked graves. Records show at least 12 students died here, their names not recorded. Our intention here today is to begin a healing process. It won't be easy. St. Paul's school was closed in 1959. A Catholic high school was built on the site. And Indigenous leaders are still waiting for more school records from Ottawa and the Catholic Church. We'll continue to work towards gathering all the archival information. Once those two pieces have concluded, then we'll be able to begin an actual field investigation of the site. That was the original school. Willie Naheny is trying to help. He's one of 18 members of his family forced to attend St. Paul's. Naheny says he's heard the stories of children who died here. We'll find out if, if there is anything here, and then um, we have to do the proper thing. From Ottawa today, money to help. Canadians are looking for ways to support Indigenous communities. In total, 320 million new dollars to search for unmarked graves, create a national monument and support survivors. But contrary to calls from some MPs, there won't be an independent prosecutor assigned to investigate residential schools. Instead, the Justice Minister is creating a special interlocutor's office. They will evaluate federal laws, policies and practices surrounding unmarked and undocumented graves and burial sites at residential schools. Naheny says that's a start. The most important, those that have been lost now return to their families and will be able to reconnect. And, and by finding them, it's like finding your lost child. Your heart starts to heal again. For many residential school survivors, sites like this one are sacred. They want the memories of those who didn't survive to be remembered and honoured. Karen Pauls, CBC News, North Vancouver. Manitoba Premier Brian Pallister has announced he'll step down before the end of his term. As Cameron McIntosh tells us, the Premier has hinted at leaving early, but it comes at a time when support for Pallister and his party is plummeting. I'm just going to make a brief statement. I gotta he kept it short, guess, no questions. Do. Brian Pallister, Manitoba's 22nd Premier, confirming what many have long suspected. He won't run again. I believe that now is the time uh, for a new leader and a Premier to take our province forward. Elected in 2016 to a record majority. Re-elected in 2019, promising a PST cut and a balanced budget. Pallister hinted at retiring early. Then, the pandemic hit. We're bringing these difficult measures forward today to protect people. Pallister was the face of the response, basking in its early successes, later on the hot seat for its shortcomings. Criticized, his government seemed unprepared for the devastating third wave. I'm the guy who's stealing Christmas to keep you safe. If 
Foster had a reputation for doing things his way, clashing with Ottawa, Winnipeg's mayor, Indigenous leaders, even his own appointees. The party is deeply unpopular and I think it's largely because of the leader himself. A poll in June put support well behind the opposition NDP. <laughs> then came this, the Canada Day toppling of a statue of Queen Victoria. The people who came here to this country uh, before it was a country and since didn't come here to destroy anything. Pallister made comments many construed as downplaying the damage of colonialism on Indigenous communities. A minister resigned, her replacement promptly added to the controversy. For the first time, government MLAs began to distance themselves. Pallister met with his caucus today. Some have said I'm a coach, others have said things less flattering. I believe that I'm a person who has never worried too much about having followers. Now, Pallister will remain premier until a new leader is chosen, someone who will have to navigate the pandemic and rebuild support for Manitoba's Conservative Party before the next election. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. In Afghanistan, the Taliban is rapidly advancing, and interpreters who helped Canadian forces are struggling to get out in time. The Afghan government does not want people to leave because it may cause a loss of morale. The bureaucracy that's putting Afghan lives in danger. Plus, a house move in Winnipeg goes terribly wrong. There was no going back. It couldn't turn around, couldn't reverse. And one student innovates a climate-friendly treat to beat the heat. I didn't expect it to blow up as much as it did, but it did really blow up. We're back in two. There are new reports tonight of human rights abuses in Afghanistan as Taliban fighters seize more and more territory. At least 183 civilians were killed in the last month, it says, and women and girls are forbidden to travel without an escort. In one case in Balkh province on the 3rd of August, a women's rights activist was shot and killed for breaching the rules. Today, an EU official said the Taliban now controls 65% of Afghanistan. That's caused an exodus of about 400,000 people, according to new government figures. The UN says the Taliban targets religious minorities, journalists, and activists. Also under threat are the Afghan interpreters who helped Canada's armed forces there. They won't be out of danger until Canada gets them out. Evan Dyer shows us what's blocking their way. Six out of 34 provincial capitals fell to the Taliban since Friday. The Afghan government is losing and losing fast. Uh, the way I look at it is the Taliban are driving a Ferrari 200 miles an hour uh, down the Autobahn and the process that we're using right now is the equivalent to a Pinto that's struggling to get out of second gear. A former Canadian Army interpreter says the Afghan government is trying to calm the rising sense of panic and putting up roadblocks for those who wish to leave. I say that of course. The Afghan government does not want people to leave because it may cause a loss of morale. As a group of interpreters prepared to board a flight to Canada this weekend, about 20 families were denied an exit visa because their Afghan passports had expired. Wendy Long is with an advocacy group that helps Afghan interpreters. They've got their bags in hand. They have nowhere left to go because they've you know, left their accommodations thinking they are starting a new life in Canada. Afghan officials are now also demanding a negative COVID test just to enter Kabul airport. The new requirements could force interpreters to come up with hundreds or even thousands of dollars that many don't have. A lot of this money is coming out of the pockets of veterans, of veteran-led organizations. The funds vets are raising online are being rapidly depleted to pay for shelter for families as refugees crowd into Afghan cities. We've had people who have had their passports ready to go for five years and now they're on the tarmac because those five years are up and their passports have just expired. So yes, um, you know, I, you know, a, a great hand of applause to the people on the ground actually working um, for, for the people, but did it need to get to this point? No. For the interpreters, survival now depends on which moves faster the wheels of bureaucracy or the offensive of the Taliban. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Chelsea, Quebec. Canada imposed new sanctions against Belarus this week, joining the United States and Britain to send a message to its autocratic leader. Alexander Lukashenko was returned to power one year ago in an election widely considered to be rigged. 
Megan Williams shows us his reaction to the sanctions, even as voices of rebellion grow louder. A burst of scornful bravado from the authoritarian leader of Belarus in the face of fresh sanctions against his country. When the UK was the first to announce the new sanctions, Alexander Lukashenko said it could choke on them. Last year, tens of thousands protested. Now, even indirect criticism of the state is dangerous. Belarusian Olympic sprinter Kristina Tsimonoskaya defected last week after she faced reprisal for criticizing her country's management of its Olympic program, run by Lukashenko's son. My grandmother, she called me and she said, you can't uh, come back to home because on the TV they say a lot of uh, bad words about you, that you have some mental problems. This case of Kristina Tsimonoskaya is very Interesting. She doesn't feel safe. Actually, majority of Belarusians do not feel safe inside the country. Other athletes have been openly part of the opposition movement for months now, like this former basketball star. People were surprised when athletes, many of us, marched. They were our fans. All of a sudden, we turned the roles. We kind of witnessed the paradigm shift of how people see us and how we see ourselves. You know, He's fled Belarus for fear of arrest. But leaving the country is no guarantee of safety. Last week, a Belarusian exile helping others flee persecution was found dead in a park near his home in Kiev, Ukraine. In May, Belarus brazenly hijacked a commercial flight to arrest a journalist and his girlfriend, still in jail. Opposition leaders say it will take more pressure from the outside to bring down Lukashenko. Sanctions should be imposed by all the democratic countries, the USA, UK, Canada, European Union and others. Uh, only in uh, this uh, joint position san sanctions uh, will be um, powerful. Megan Williams, CBC News, Florence. Yesterday's UN report aimed a spotlight at the climate crisis, but the pandemic made seeing the effects more difficult. Our glasses are very dirty and we're, they're, they're getting dirtier as we speak. Why COVID made gathering data difficult and how it affects our forecasts. But first, with Michael Spavor's verdict handed down, what could come next for all three Canadians imprisoned in China? Let's return to our top story tonight. Canadian Michael Spaver found guilty of espionage in China. His sentence, 11 years, a fine roughly equal to $10,000 Canadian and deportation. To help us understand what this means for Michael Spaver and also Michael Kovrig, let's bring in Ben Rosewell, a former Canadian diplomat and president of the Canadian International Council. And tonight he's in Prince Edward Island. Uh, first of all, your reaction to the verdict and sentence tonight? Well, this is a very long story. Uh, it's been developing for a long time. I do think we've got quite a few chapters uh, still to go. It has become this, the abiding uh, issue of our foreign policy in these days. Um, and I don't think anyone expected that either in the Canada-China relationship to become so poisonous uh, over these uh, detentions or uh, for, frankly, a, a consular issue to become so dominant and so divisive in, uh, in Canada. No matter what happens uh, to Michael Spavor and to Michael Kovrig, I do think that Canadian foreign policy, and particularly our foreign policy towards the second most powerful country in the world, will never be the same again. So drawing on your long experience as a diplomat and somebody that studies diplomacy now, what sort of options does Canada have here? So uh, Canada's got to um, look at the the breadth of its relationship with uh, with China. I mean, this is the country that's reshaping the world uh, as it as it grows. It's testing out its relationship with uh, with other countries. Um, and while we focus on the immediate goal of getting the two Michaels home safe and sound, and sparing the life of Robin Schellenberg and protecting any future Canadians who might run afoul of the regime in uh, in Beijing, I do think we have to play. The long game, um, China is sort of testing out its new relationship with the rest of the world now that it's become so powerful and everyone recognizes it's eventually going to be the top economic country, uh, maybe we'll challenge the United States militarily at some point. We could look at this chapter of the detentions and the two Michaels as one area where China tested its limits and, in fact, 
I think found some pretty um, serious pushback, not mm -hmm. just from Canada, but from this coalition of countries that came together. We saw them today at the, the trial of Michael Spavor, representatives of 25 countries who went all the way to this, this obscure town of Dandong to show their support for Canadians, and in fact, for any citizen of any country in the world living and operating in China to make the, the message back to the, the Beijing regime, this should never, ever happen again. A late night on the East Coast, Ben. We appreciate you uh, sticking with us and providing that analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good night. Next on The National, a move that destroyed a boulevard and frustrated Winnipeg residents. Big house, narrow road. Stay with us. Welcome back. Crucial to the landmark UN report yesterday outlining the devastating, irreversible effects of climate change is scientific research. But that other big global crisis, the COVID pandemic, has put a damper on how we gather climate data. In the story we first brought you in December, Tom Murphy explains. Consider this. The ocean is teeming with clues that allow scientists to interpret everything from your long-range weather forecast to the latest climate change affecting the Earth. The problem is, with COVID restrictions, oceanographers like Brad DeYoung haven't been able to get out there to study the ocean's latest hints of where this globe is headed. It's really critical because we can't understand it by just staring at the ocean from the shoreline. We actually have to be at in the ocean, at sea, making these measurements. Do you feel like we're flying blind a little bit right now? I feel like we're, we're our glasses are very dirty and we're, they're, they're getting dirtier as we speak. Normally, there's a vast network of scientists on the water all over the world, monitoring our oceans with high-tech gadgets like this autonomous wave glider. It can track the endangered North Atlantic right whale, for example, find its food, inform big ships to steer clear to protect the near-extinct species. This is one of our wave gliders. But Anya Waite of the Ocean Frontier Cars. Institute in Halifax and says the pandemic the means fewer gliders, research trips cancelled. It's much harder to get ocean observations than it was before COVID. And the ships are holding fewer people. You have to be socially distanced. They're crewed um, fewer days of the year. Now, if you figure all that measuring of waves, wind, and atmosphere doesn't affect you, think of your long-range forecast. Every time you look at what temperature is going to be tomorrow, and you see that nice hourly thing, you can get that app, that's ocean data. Right? And for some companies, it is especially critical. The petroleum industry and oil industry, they depend on good weather forecasting. Um, and they also use a lot of ocean data to understand how their infrastructure is going to be interacting with the ocean over the, you know, the course, the lifetime of that infrastructure. All those industries and government agencies, lobster fishers, lots of people use ocean data and they don't know they're using it. All that technology out there emitting data, measuring waves and winds, how the ocean interacts with the atmosphere, many of it is run by batteries that have either died or are about to. Thousands of devices beaming back millions of bits of ocean data informing the so-called blue economy, from companies insuring shipping lines to fishermen relying on weather forecasts. They're all a little more in the dark these days. Emma Heslop is with the Global Ocean Observing System out of France. So we see far fewer scientists being able to, to, to go on board, less science being done. So imagine things like uh, El Nino, La Nina. This is a coupled ocean atmosphere phenomena, and it's vital to have ocean measurements for that in order to, to have any kind of prediction for wildfires in Australia and you know, what the impact will be sort of in, in the US and, and up into, into Canada on the, um, on the west coast there. Case in point, this device, the Argo. It drops to the depths of the ocean, periodically coming to the surface to emit data to a satellite. But with scientists being kept on shore, unable to attend to them, their flow of data is down an estimated 10%. Even data from the marine life tagged with transmitters is down 50% because fewer of them are able to be tagged now. And some of the research will never be recovered. 
Remember that huge ice shelf collapse, the one in Canada's north? That's a moment scientists will never get back. What is lost when, for example, scientists, the eyes and ears of the scientists, are not there to witness and to explain something like an ice shelf collapse? In a laboratory, I can redo an experiment, but you can't do, redo the ice shelf collapse experiment. So when we miss these opportunities to see what's happening, uh, then we're you know, losing understanding or just a recognition of the impact that climate change will have on, on the environment around us. And then there's this year's hurricane season. Brad DeYoung's team was supposed to be flying a drone into those storms. Because of COVID, he couldn't. And of course, this year, we've seen 30 now uh, named storms the most ever on record. The, the key thing that we're losing then is the information about that, the formation of these hurricanes. This German research cruise is back up and running, one of the few. Some COVID restrictions have been modified, but the work is still slowed. Emma Heslop says often you can get half the data for twice the cost. Some networks, they lost the ability to observe perhaps 90% of their data. Um, so I think that uh, it, it's kind of a, a wake up call as an observing system that we, we, we need to have uh, build greater uh, flexibility. She says it could be a year or more before things really get back to normal, but fears a gaping hole in our true understanding of 2020 on the ocean could ultimately lead to a less complete picture of climate change. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Halifax. Moving is always stressful, but usually not on a scale like this. A move gone wrong in Winnipeg led to a criminal charge after nearly two dozen trees were mowed down by a house in motion. The movers did have a permit to do this, but it's clear that other planning fell short. Partway through the process, police were called to investigate the destruction of at least a dozen trees. There was no going back. It couldn't turn around, couldn't reverse, couldn't change their shift the load or any of that. So staff actually had to make a call tree by tree, one by one, as the truck proceeded to determine whether uh, a tree could be saved or preserved and the truck could get around it. The final toll, 23 trees, police charging the driver with mischief over $5,000. But as all of this blew up on social media, a local councillor said that's not enough. The city should be actively pursuing uh, a civil lawsuit today. Like, let's get working on this right now to ensure that we, uh, we receive damages. The city now assessing what it will cost to make this boulevard green again. Typecasting in Hollywood is nothing new, but the consequences could be harmful. People don't just wake up hating Muslims. They believe a story. Coming up, examining the effects of racist depictions of Muslims in film. Next. Welcome back. Legendary NHL goaltender Tony Esposito has died. He's got to beat Tony Esposito, one of the best goalies in the business. He shoots Esposito save. Esposito rose to fame in the early 70s with the Chicago Blackhawks. He would go on to be a five-time All-Star and a three-time winner of the Vezina Trophy, awarded then to the goalie on the team that allowed the fewest goals. In 1972, he was one of the starting goalies in the historic Summit Series against the Soviet Union. Tony Esposito died after a brief battle with pancreatic cancer. He was 78 years old. American actor Christina Applegate has announced she has multiple sclerosis. She posted about her diagnosis on Twitter, calling it a tough road. The 49-year-old began acting as a child with a breakout role in Married with Children. She then won an Emmy in 2003 for her guest role on Friends. So beautiful. Oh, I know, isn't she? Oh. No, I was talking about your bedding. Applegate tweeted asking for privacy as she goes, quote, through this thing, multiple sclerosis damages the central nervous system. There is no cure. According to the MS Society of Canada, 2.8 million people around the world have been diagnosed with the illness. Canada has one of the highest rates in the world. Hollywood has long been criticized for its lack of diversity on and off the screen. But even when minority groups are represented, 
it often has been through harmful stereotypes. In a story that first aired earlier this summer, Eli Glasner looked at how Muslims are represented on screen and what some in the industry are doing to change that. Welcome to the land where the water to drown us and... Toronto's Ali Momin is many things. An actor, a podcaster. A healthcare system underfunded. Even an aspiring politician. But he'll never forget how Hollywood first cast him. Suicide bomber number three. In the movie Traitor with Don Cheadle. He was trained to kill. Eager for acting credits, Momin accepted. In hindsight, I deeply regret it. I wish I never said yes. But if I'm to be honest, you know, we use the word systemic all the time. I was a part of a system. As his career continued, so did the offers. Terrorists, nefarious bad guys, generic Arab speakers, even though he's a non-Arab from Iran. It otherizes you. And even when, like, even when there is a Muslim res representation that isn't um, terrorist-like or nefarious, it's, it's exoticized. A recent study confirms how Hollywood overlooks and ignores the Muslim community. Of the top 100 films in the U.S. from 2017 to 2019, only 1.1 percent of the speaking roles were Muslim. Then there's the issue of violence. Specifically, about 40 percent of Muslim characters were shown as perpetrators of violence, and more than half of Muslim characters were shown as targets of violence. We also saw that 19 percent of Muslim characters in our sample also died by the end of the film. Oscar-winning actor Riz Ahmed is part of a group that commissioned this study. He sees a connection between what happened in London, Ontario, and what we see on our screens. People don't just wake up hating Muslims. They believe a story, a story that we have to look at ourselves and ask whether we are complicit in perpetuating. To combat that, Ahmed's partners are launching new guides and grants to support Muslim-centered stories. I got fired. Huh? Like the comedy series Dirty Love. Ottawa's Mesa Huri was tired of playing terrorist wives and refugees, so she created a show with a contemporary view of Muslim life. I just wanted to be who I am, and I want to be able to show that on, on screen as well. We all have a story. Using stories to push back against the stereotypes. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Up next, using the power of the sun to keep things cool. Everyone drives by and they ask, they're like, oh, it's a solar-powered ice cream stand, that's so cool. How this young entrepreneur is thinking green next in our moment. This, of course, is usually what happens if you leave an ice cream cone in the sun, but one inventive Nova Scotia teenager is using the sun's heat to keep ice cream cool. For her summer job, she decided to open a mobile ice cream truck entirely powered by solar energy. Tonight, she is our moment. My ice cream stand is solar powered. We have three panels on top on the roof, so they kind of charge the sink and the freezer. So it was one regular and one kid? Everyone drives by and they ask, they're like, oh, it's a solar powered ice cream stand, that's so cool. I was just thinking that this was more of a summer job. I didn't expect it to blow up as much as it did, but it did really blow up and I'm really thankful for that. It definitely took a lot of time and effort. My dad really was a big help. Lots of research about the solar energy. It's a wonderful idea. I think it's very in inventive. The ice cream is absolutely delicious. <laughs> <laughs> just with everything going on in the world, like pollution-wise, it's just really terrible. There you Would you go. like a cup with that? And I think that more people should really try out the solar power thing. Because it honestly doesn't take a lot. And you really just, everyone needs to step up their game. If I can, anyone can. Okay, so solar power, that's really a very timely thing. She has 50 to 60 customers a day consistently throughout the summer. I hope that Jim Treliving, the uh, longtime dragon and kind of the franchise king of Canada, is watching, or maybe he'll see this online, because uh, I feel like this could be franchise. By the way, top flavor is something called Moon Mist. Grape, banana, bubblegum. Our producer says it is uh, an Atlantic Canada fave. Not when I was growing up, but it sounds really good. That is the National for August 10th. Good night.